45 men and women pursue an extraordinary dream. 22 countries, 19 months, a voyage around the world. Tall Ship Chronicles. Okay, up short! Move out! Hold it there! Hold! Mr. Mate, do we have all hands on board? What you're looking at is not some historically accurate, digitally enhanced, computerized Hollywood image. Oh no. The modern day tall ship you see slicing its way across the Caribbean is very real. This is the Picton Castle out of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. And for the next 19 months, it will be my home. Back the vessels to port! Set the four lower topsail! I'm Andrew Younghusband. Five years ago, I vowed never again to live with roommates. Today, I'm sharing this square rigger with 42 of the largest personalities I've ever met. We've all walked away from our jobs, our friends, our families, and our whole lives to be here. Most of us know each other about as well as we know how to sail a tall ship, which is to say, not at all. But we're going to sail this three-masted bark around the world. Even along the windlass! So who are we? Well, the first thing you should know is that when you meet 40 some odd people all at once, you wind up calling them by their first names and where they're from. For example, that's the trainee Liz from Florida. That's James from England. Mikkel from Denmark is the assistant engineer. Lauren from South Africa is another one of the professional crew. And that's Peter from Southern California. Hey, start cranking. Everybody who can go up, go up. We're about half and half men and women. There's eight professional crew and 35 trainees who range in age from 12-year-old Sloan from Martha's Vineyard to 57-year-old Jim, who's also from New England. Aside from the captain, there is only one warm-blooded being on board who has sailed around the world before. Chibley, the ship's well-traveled cat. And that's me razzing Lindsay from Ontario. Are you gonna eat the pork chops tonight? No. Come on, now's the time to give up on this foolish vegetarianism. <laughs> I can go down and look. We have to make every effort to get along. We'd kill each other if we didn't. The hull of this ship is only 155 feet long, and there's nowhere that's truly private. Below decks, we're crammed head to foot into double-decker bunks. This so-called main salon is where almost half of us sleep and all of us eat. Ten of us crash out in the tiny forecastle squished into the bow. In the stern, eight women sleep in the cruelly named Bat Cave. And for being the last to join the ship, Maria gets to sleep in the forepeak with all the tools. Cast off your bundling. Sheet home for the gallant. Sure, we're all here for the adventure of a lifetime, but I bet it's more complicated than that for some. I wonder if anyone here came to flee a heartache, or to dodge their taxes, or perhaps to put the ship into relationship. Start it whenever you can. Before we left, we were asked about our hopes, fears, goals, and expectations for this voyage. I mean, I guess one of the things I'm kind of scared about is just being at sea for like long periods of time, and just you know being able to deal with other people. Uh, my biggest fear is I don't want anyone on the crew to get hurt seriously hurt, which means they have to be evacuated and, and leave the ship. It's, it's going to be like family in a lot of ways, and then ma magnified, you know, like living with your family locked up in your house for a year is something I don't think anyone has ever experienced or ever really wants to. Have I thought about what it'll be like when it's crappy? Yeah, it'll be crappy. Will people hate each other? I would imagine. <laughs> you know, Jesus, there's 16 people living in the dining room. <laughs> I'm actually looking more forward to the passages, to being out at sea and learning to function as part of a crew and being part of a group um, 
even more than the ports? Well, I had two reactions. One is friends and family wish they could do the same thing. The other is, are you crazy? <laughs> Half the time I was saying, what am I thinking? So I had two very different reactions from all, all groups of people. I saw the window of opportunity. I didn't even bother to open it. I just went right through. Uh, it's just very slippery. <laughs> just have to be careful. <laughs> So I wipe my hands off of my pants on my clothes, anywhere. So my hands aren't gooped. But this stuff's easier to put on with your hands, so. We're gonna get real dirty on this voyage. This stuff being tar. Some jobs, like the perpetual tarring of the rigging, never end. We each have to work eight hours a day to keep this thing in ship shape, and a lot of that work happens way up there, aloft. To get a better understanding of these tall ships and what it's like to work seven stories above the deck while hanging by a thread, it was recommended that I read Eric Newby's account of his work on a four-masted bark back in the dying days of commercial sail. Hi, but he describes going up for the very first time. He'd never been up aloft before. And uh, what he describes the ship as being like is, is basically identical to this. You know, there's cables, cables holding up the mast, and uh, Rope rattlings, you know, these, these things here that we're standing on are just tired rope, tired hemp. And it's identical, you know, what they were sailing in the 1930s to run grain around. And that was the end of that kind of idea of using these ships as cargo vessels was identical to this. And so being on this ship, you can immediately think of Captain Bly and Captain Cook. And this is, this is how they got around. This is how, they, they, this is how the world was opened up. This is how the world was discovered, sailing this kind of ship. and. Uh, you know, it really is like being on a time machine. It's, it's an exciting thing to be up here and know that this is how the world was discovered. And this is how all of us are discovering ourselves, you know? For years, I've lived near the sea, but now that I'm living on the sea, it's become a whole lot more daunting than it was when I gazed at it through the living room window. Wow, it's the most beautiful, uh, rewarding, uh, thing in the world, but it'll kill you dead in a heartbeat with no remorse. Constant vigilance is the price of safety at sea. It won't, it won't cut you any slack. This, isn't, this is not our element. I'm in my element, lying on the couch watching sports on TV. Left alone at the helm, my mind always drifts. At first I think things like, which side turns to port? And by the end of my hour-long shift, I'm thinking things like, Damn, out here you could get killed by the weather. How did I get here? Well, let's back up a few weeks. <laughs> to the Halifax airport. Right now, the ship is docked an hour's drive from here in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. I just want to get there, but before I can even hook up with my luggage, I meet Annalisa from Toronto. Hey, Annalisa. Nice to meet you. Annalisa. Annalisa is another trainee, and it doesn't take long to find out that we are in the exact same boat. Fabulous. So, do you have any experience with this? No, no. Right? Oh, I've, been on, I've been on the ferry often for like you know, a dozen <laughs> times. That's, that's it. That's, there's my whole sailing experience getting on the ferry. So, uh, I'm, you know. I don't think I've ever been aboard anything that was like smaller than 900 feet right. long. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm a little bit spooked actually. Oh yeah, I'm I'm alternating between excitement and abject terror. All right. Abject. How long in the middle of the night. Boat? Like how long has this been a planning? Or? Two months. Two months. Almost to the day. Two months. Almost yeah. To the day. And it, during that time, I have uh, I sold sold my house, closed my business, got all my immunizations, put all my stuff in storage. You sold your house? Yeah. Annalisa has already met another one of our shipmates. Just met Greg over there. We're, Who's that? Uh, another another trainee crew. Okay. Um, and we're just hanging out, waiting for the, waiting for our ride. And there's one more person coming. Uh, someone called Moses, Mexican guy. So off we went to find Greg. And as we did, Annalisa told me that all she wanted to find when she stepped off the plane was some guy holding a sign with her name on. What she found instead will have much longer lasting implications. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. What I don't know is at this stage, Greg and Annalisa have spent the last three hours together stranded in the airport. And where are you from? Uh, 
Michigan. From Michigan? Okay. Yeah. Where are you from? From Newfoundland. Newfoundland, okay. Wow. You can probably tell just by looking at me that I'm not exactly the type of person you'd call a salty sea dog. A month ago, when I got a call from a television executive about taking this trip, I'd never even heard of the Picton Castle. Now, as I'm seeing it for the first time, yeah, sure, I'm awestruck with nervous energy, but deep down, I'm thinking that maybe I've gotten myself into something that I should have avoided. I'm not a sailor. I'm a writer, an actor, a television reporter. In short, I'm a guy who wears makeup to work, okay? At this stage, my anxiety-riddled brain is screaming at me, you're gonna hate this whole sailing thing, young husband. Luckily, though, I was able to act upon the smaller, yet more rational part of my brain that was reminding me to simply smile and act normal. Are you looking for Hi. the captain? I am, yeah. All righty, I'm supposed to tell you where he is. Uh, well, actually, he's, a, he's around. I'll show you which door he's through. Sure, no, he's not in there. Yeah, just on the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he went. How are you? I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. I'm Jennifer. Nice you part of the crew? I am. You are coming? Yeah. Amateur. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sail trainee. Oh, you're you're one of us. You're me. <laughs> I am indeed. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Where so, are you from? I'm from Seattle. Okay. And where are you from? Canada. From Newfoundland. Yeah. Newfoundland. What's yeah. your last name? Young husband. My uh, crowd, my family are all from uh, There's the Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> and here he is, Captain Dan Moreland. Now that's a guy who doesn't wear makeup to work. Hi, so is, this, is this Andrew? This that's is me. Andrew. Andrew, this how is do you Dan. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, making it out? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm good. You know, I'm a bit shell shocked, a bit freaked out. A little I'm nervous. all right. A little, yeah. You yeah. should be nervous. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's something to be nervous about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any idea what you're getting into? Not really. No. I, have, uh, in all honesty, no. I have no idea. None. No. I mean, I was amazed just now. I was amazed just None? now. You should have some idea. Well, I was amazed just now, you know, it seeing might be the, the people idea. at the. Uh, it might be the wrong idea, but you should have an idea. I don't, though. This is this is true, right? I, I, you know, the ferry. That's that's my boating experience. Intimidating guy, but he's got the right. The Moreland holds a rare captain's license that allows him to control any sailing vessel of any tonnage in any ocean in the world. And get this, before he took the Picton Castle on its first world voyage in 1997, more people had been to the moon in the last 50 years than had sailed around the globe on a square-rigged bark. So, my ignorance is understandable. That's an idea, but I don't know, I don't have any idea what my life will be like on board the vessel. Well, it's going to be painful. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be, uh, well, it's going to be different. At different times, you're going to love it, and sometimes you're going to hate it. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to love me, and sometimes you're going to hate me. Sure. Uh, but I don't have any control over that. And you don't have much either. No, and I'm sure you'll hate me too, so. No, I, I'll be indifferent. It'll come around. I'll be worse, it'll be indifferent. <laughs> uh, uh, worse than hate, it'll be indifference. I think what I'm supposed to pick up here is that my mental state, like this refitted former fishing trawler, will be all over the map. How common were these boats in the 1800s? Extremely. Extremely. But that was the 1800s. Right. right. And they weren't boats, they're ships. Excuse me. No, that's a boat. What's the difference? You wouldn't call a car a truck, would you? I call my truck a car, but it's very small. But you wouldn't do that, <laughs> would you? You wouldn't call it a stallion a mare. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Thanks. So wherein lies the difference? I don't, I don't understand the You'll difference. You'll pick that up in the next year and a half. OK. You'll know that intimately. Good enough. Andrew, come on up. Um, Andrew's the second mate. Hi, how are you? I'm Andrew. Andrew also. And so began my orientation with 19-year-old Andy from Washington State the third highest ranking officer on board. Some people's blanks are a disaster. Mine's spotless now, but it'll get messy. All your mess should stay within Contained in your space. It can be a disaster inside your bunk. It's okay right, with us as long space. as it's inside your bunk. Yeah. More people die of falling down, not die, get hurt, hurt from falling down steps and tripping over stuff on ships than anything else, okay? Yeah. It's very nice to think about <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to think that people get hurt falling out of the rig and stuff. Well, it doesn't happen. People right. are really scared up there. They're not going to fall out of the rig. Right. It's really easy to fall down the steps and trip over things. Yeah. So be conscious of those safety issues. Okay. Forget about safety issues up here and you'll be unconscious. In my naivete, I figured my first week in Lunenburg would involve some simple classroom stuff, where we'd discuss the finer points of sailing in a cushy, sterile environment. Instead, I'm half frozen and fully soaked, performing a tightrope act in the rain 80 feet above the deck.
The Picton Castle hasn't even left the dock yet, but I've already learned Square Rig Sailing's most important lesson, and that is, not knowing how to do something is no excuse not to do it. That's because if you don't do the work, it just doesn't get done. The sail gets hoisted up, uh, unfurled through a long process of pulling and tugging and making straight. Just pull the sail tight. Fix it on with all these things, these row bands. And again? Once more? Uh, no? Is it good? Sure, yeah. yeah. Six. We're learning how to bend sail. Bend being the sailing term for attaching sails to yards. Yards being the sailing term for those cross beams. Crazy is the generic term for bending sail in November during a maritime rainstorm without a harness or a prayer or even so much as a hat on my wet head. Wet being the sailing term for stupid. Yeah, but another fathom. The old salts say you can't fall if you're holding on, but when we neophytes come down from aloft, we buzz as though we've just survived a brush with death. If someone who is, had just come in asked, so what happens if you fall? And someone just said, you die. You know, that's, it's, it's enough of a height. I do. I have morbid thoughts, actually, up there. I think um, I like actually being further out on the yard because then you're over the water. And I think, well, if I fall, <laughs> maybe I'll hit the water. But if I'm closer into the mass, then I start thinking, well, if I fall, <laughs> I'm going to hit that yard, and then I'm going to hit that pin, and then I might bounce off, into <laughs> and it's awful. But it gives me incentive to hang on. <laughs> when I was asked about my worst fear for this voyage, falling from the rig what? was all I could think about. Worst is I wind up paralyzed. I'll tell you that right now. That's the worst. Dying, not nearly as bad in my mind. Bad for my family. Dying would suck for my mother. I'd feel bad about that. Worse for me, paralyzed. That scares me, man. The weather is depressing, but at least it's a common enemy for us. We strangers are getting to know each other both individually and as a group. We already know who the jokers are, who the leaders are, the followers. It's who likes hard work and who just doesn't. See the TV guy working hard as usual, <laughs> just <laughs> directing going us. Straight, just keep job. going. <laughs> and uh, you might want to pick it up a little. Physically, I like the work life. Um, Dan, Dan, Dan. Dan, and then take it right where my hand is. I got there. Three. It's inspiring to see the power of 40 people as we shrug off the bone chilling dampness and work together toward a common goal. It's also inspiring to know that we'll be educating more than just ourselves on this trip. Thousands of school books have been gathered by a group called Worldwise, and we'll be distributing these texts from the Galapagos to South Africa. Also going into the hold is 19 months worth of canned goods and dry stores, as well as tons of random supplies the ship's purser will trade for profit along the way. Right. There we are. We were supposed to leave tomorrow, but the North Atlantic isn't ready to have us. Violent high seas have turned that ocean into a death trap, and if the stormy long-term forecast continues, we may never get to set these sails. We retire again to the unheated main salon and wonder aloud if we'll ever embark on our 37,000 mile journey around the world to 47 ports in 22 countries. The captain knows that our spirits could get squashed by a long delay, so he keeps us hopeful by resetting our departure date for two days time. So things look good, like a space launch, we're still uh, T minus two and counting. Uh, we will motor significantly to get south. With the first few days, unless we just get a roaring perfect breeze, I will definitely be burning up some dinosaurs to get south. Not a place, North Atlantic, not a place to hang out. We can dawdle down here, we can sort of go slow here, but not a good place to go slow. Fiji, they are having a little revolution. Pesky little coup d'etat. Uh, I quite, it probably doesn't affect visitors and stuff there at the time being, but we'll, we'll, we'll monitor that. And if it could happen, we have to skip it. I don't want to skip Fiji. But if there's too many bullets flying around, well, mom and dad get worried about that sort of thing, you know. And <laughs> what else do mom and dad worry about? Pirates. In the South China Sea, they're looking actually just to get the ship, kill the crew, and 
do something else to the ship. We're not going anywhere near where pirates are, and pirates is very isolated. They, they've got their little turf, they've got small boats that don't go very far, so it's, it's easy to avoid them. It means we have to avoid those areas. <laughs> It'll be good to get out of here. It's fun, sure. It's a tension release, it's a good way to get to know each other, but it's hell on our livers. And it's completely destroying our ability to speak in coherent sentences. We don't set sail the next day, or the next day, or even the day after that. A rumor goes around that on its last world voyage, the Picton Castle left a month late. We all know that our sailing schedule is more of an itinerary than a true schedule, but try telling that to a parent who's always known the exact whereabouts of her daughter. Who's my mom? Hello. <laughs> She's a beaut, huh? <laughs> uh, so. Hmm? I'll take care of her. Yeah, you'll take care of her. She'll take care of you too, right? We're itching to go. Beyond this sheltered harbor, the North Atlantic is still turbulent, but the captain's got some good news. Weather uh, looks like easterly gales tonight, nasty. The northerly gales tomorrow, so that's great because we're headed south. So we've set the departure time at 11 a.m. tomorrow. We've been promised that today will be the day we get to leave Lunenburg. Okay, yeah. But we've been told that before. So we wait with bated breath for the chief mate's official oh. announcement. We're, uh, we're gonna leave today. Yeah. Our emotions are so frayed, we don't even know if we're coming or going. What they don't really understand is that they're already gone. They don't, they don't, they think going means leaving. And no, they've already gone, they've, they've gone some time ago. So they've already gone, the voyage has begun. We just need to let go of the lines. Uh, at the appropriate moment. Now it is real, very real. Most of us won't see our loved ones again for a year and a half. It's romantic to think that this dockside scene has been the same for sailors for centuries, but right now, romance is nowhere near this wharf. Here, there's just prayers and wishes and tears and loneliness. Wade Cornell is our cameraman. It's the toughest job of his career, and it begins with one of the most surreal shots, filming his wife, Gabrielle, as she asks me to take care of him for her. Gabe and Wade are old friends of mine, so this moment gets me a little bit choked up. Then the captain snuffs out any emotion I might show by giving me an order to release a line. They call the midship spring. That's you, Andrew's midship spring. And when the captain gives you an order, crying is simply not cool. Braces off! Braces off! Upper topsail braces off! Steady. As we sail away from North America, my anxieties reappear. What the hell am I doing? Where on earth is my life going? No time for introspection now, though. There's a whole lot of ocean to get acquainted with. Apparently, this is near perfect conditions for the North Atlantic in November. There's a lot to find out, and as they say, before we can run, we have to learn how to walk. Well, we're here. Now the preparation's over, the learning begins, and there's an amazing amount to learn, and probably more than you want to learn. We also have to learn how to walk. First thing, people are sliding all over the place. Take responsibility for walking. No one else can do that for you. You know, learn to stand like the old sailors, kind of, you know, look at the legs are apart. Same aloft, put your legs apart and then you can adjust your trim on the yards. With a green crew, the captain has to be the strong arm of the law and he starts by making an example out of Sven in the red plaid shirt. 
Keep your hands out of your pockets. When you're working, do not smoke. Why? Because that's not one hand for your ship and one hand for your cigarette. It's one hand for a ship and one hand for yourself. I will taunt you a second time. I'm a little seasick. Some people are a lot seasick. But don't worry, we'll spare you the vomit shots. No sense in making you sick too. Hey, yesterday was such a weird emotional day, you know? The build up to the leave and the anticipation and then not leaving and then building up and then not leaving and building up and then not leaving. And then yesterday to leave was just like exuberance and then exhaustion finally kicked in because the tension of when is, was over, you know? Today everybody's just like, yeah. It's happening, we're gonna go sail around the world. And that's the wild thing, we are gonna sail around the world. When this ship was in, um, was in port, to me it felt like a Hollywood prop, you know? There it was, yeah, yeah, sure, it's not real. It's lashed up to the dock, it doesn't move, it's got a flat surface. Man, we pulled out, after the first hour the engines were shut off, we have been clipping at, the rumors of about, at about nine knots, we've been clipping along in this old school square rig sail sailboat ship for a day and a half now and we're trucking along it's it's amazing that it's not actually a hollywood prop it's a real ship and we're really going lunenberg is now four days behind us the captain has turned on the engines and we're motoring south just as fast as we can. We don't want to get caught in a storm. In case you're wondering, this is not a storm. We're heading down to the Caribbean, then to Panama and on to the South Pacific. Places that are hotter than hell. Right, I'll believe that when I see it. Then, overnight, everything changes. We hit the Gulf Stream, and suddenly, sailing this tall ship is everything the brochure said it would be. Some of my family's shuffling snow. <laughs> Nothing could mentally prepare us for this. The Lunenburg winter coats are gone, and the tropical swim trunks are on. Talk about jumping into the deep end. To touch bottom here, you'd have to sink down three and a half miles. This lifestyle is full of romance. Just look at what we're doing and think about where we're going. Oh yeah, romance is definitely in the air. The captain will let anybody come on this voyage, but couples are not invited. Single people on board becoming couples, however, well, that can cause the same problems, but forbidding it would be a bigger problem. I would be willing to bet money that there will be couples on board. Uh, it's inevitable when you take, you know, 50 men and women and stick them on a ship. Oh, baby. Remember Greg and Annalisa? Uh, this stuff is like Baker's chocolate. Tea. How can I put this delicately? It's not like they went out and got engaged or anything, but... Private stash. Scotia trawler. Mm. Mm. Where we do all our shopping. <laughs> it's great if it works, but from personal experience, um, relationships on board a tall ship can be poisonous. And uh, they can tear down a lot more than they build up. You know, so, personally, I don't recommend them. <laughs> I mean, things happen very, very fast aboard a ship, you know? Things that would take, I mean, there's a telescoping of time, so then things that would take six months or a year to begin, develop, mature, and die, would normally would happen in, in seven days, six days aboard a ship, so. I live a bit of a hermit lifestyle, and I'm a transient kind of soul, and there's some things that I'm not sure if they're real and necessarily if they're real for me. Uh, but in a kind of storybook kind of world, I would like them to happen. <laughs>
right? And that would be falling in love and uh, living a normal life, you know? Not necessarily settling down, but actually having a, uh, a, a clinching relationship. And the last time they went around the world with uh, 40 people, there's three marriages resulting. Two, six. Two, six. If you can't Two, tell, getting personal can make me squirm. So, um... Midships! So let's talk about the man whose job it is to get us safely around the world. In a way, I've put my life in his hands. I don't really know anything about him, but I do know this. Hold the clue line. Hold the clue line. Captain Dan Moreland is a sailor. He's down the clues. Not a cute yacht club social sailor, but a real sailor. A no-nonsense, cut-to-the-chase kind of ocean-going guy who says what he means, and more importantly, knows what he says. The foresail will actually let go the fore sheet, that's not shown in this drawing, will let go the headsail sheets. That'll take pressure off the bow. Now the ship starts to turn. He's sailed on tall ships his whole adult life. He's an expert in sea currents, marine charts, wind, rope, wood, canvas, and steel. And then it's let go and haul. Now, I have a bit of a confession to make about the captain. I'm afraid of him. Not on a physical level, although I'm sure he could beat me senseless if he took a notion to. No, I'm afraid he doesn't respect me. Or any of us, for that matter. That's well the sheets. Uh, put it on the right cleat, James. The correct cleat, that would be it. There you go. Hands to the halyard, royal sheets off. Lee brace off. The captain is never there to witness our craftiness or wit or hard work, but screw up and he'll magically appear. Sven, it's going to need some pulling. I want him to be proud of me in the same way that a child wants to please a parent. But even if he was pleased, he wouldn't tell me. He's too busy dealing with what's not being dealt with. Somebody go to the goddamn alley. Is Captain Fearing universal? I mean, did our captain fear his captains when he was learning the ropes? Royal Halyard, let's go. Take it off the pin, take it off. Hello, hello, hello. Synchronized rope pulling, get together. This is a vertical line. Hoist away. And repeat the order. Who's going to? Thank you. Who knows? Personal questions are just not the kind of thing you'd ever ask him. He's the captain, the king, the untouchable autocratic god of this vessel. I'm pretty open and candid with why things are the way they are. I mean, I can't explain everything every minute, but you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable. These are all intelligent adult, adults. There's no reason why they shouldn't understand you know, why we're doing what we're doing. And we are the mere plebes, just waiting to do what we're told. The chief mate and this tanker have agreed on different headings so we don't collide. The mate then told Mac from Alberta to bear southwest. Hey, mind you how, you're on southwest, right? I'm a dead on her now, Bill. Huh? Dead on south. Southwest by south. Oh, we don't want that. I give you a new course. Southwest. southwest. See, I'm trying to set something up with this guy. So you got to pay attention to what you're doing. No fucking around. Yes, sir. So get it on southwest and hold it there. Humility is only one of the things we have to learn. This is the main gallant brace. This is the main royal brace. <laughs> Oh shit, this one I always forget. Oh, the sheet. Okay, the main, or the mizzen, the mizzen staysail sheet. Yep. Okay, cool. And this, Gatlin. Any progress is cause for celebration. We got it. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I'd like to learn uh, sail making by hand. Um, I would ideally like to, uh, to be making my living with my hands. I don't want to be sitting in front of a computer screen anymore. I mean, for me to go out there now, I need to be told literally everything. And what I'm looking for is the information to not have to do that, to be able to look up and know what needs to be done without somebody barking orders at me. I, I want to be very physical, less cerebral, just physically tired at the end of the day and doing something incredibly wonderful and fantastic like sailing this ship. Yeah. And then we go up through there. Actually, I did think it was kind of strange. I'm getting goosebumps. Ask me about ghosts on board this ship, and I'd say, oh, please, look, I've got enough real things to worry about. Ask Jenny, the lawyer from Seattle, though, and you'll get a different answer. Okay, 
So as I was kind of going back to sleep, closed my eyes, I said, I wonder if this ship has ghosts on it. Because it occurred to me that maybe this might be a ghost, which doesn't alarm me because my family has ghosts. <laughs> We've all seen ghosts. I've seen ghosts before. And it was a nice ghost. It wasn't a bad ghost at all. We have no TV, no radio, no internet, nothing to occupy our minds except work. Maybe that's why we're creating our own folklore. Or maybe it's because the ship has ghosts. And so I looked, and there's no one on the stairs. I thought, Chris, you're losing it. I distinctly, I woke up because I distinctly heard someone say my name. I distinctly heard someone go, Annalisa. Come on. Honest to God. Honest to God, a man's voice. And I woke up because I thought there was somebody coming to wake us up for watch. But it, you know, I looked at my watch and it wasn't time. Apparently one ghost haunts the engine room. Two, the ship was in World War II, and she was hit by a couple mines. One blew, like, the bow completely out of the water. And uh, there was an engineer, and he fell down the stairs when the explosion occurred. And uh, there's a ghost walking around there ever since. He's a good ghost. He helps people. And his name is Mr. Roundhead. And Bryson swears he's seen Mr. Roundhead. Now, he says Mr. Roundhead only haunts the ship <laughs> from the cargo hatch through the engine room to the stern. And there's a new ghost, and he's much different, and he's mischievous, mischievous, and he haunts the ship from the cargo hatch to the bow. And that's the one I saw. So there you are. <laughs> and I saw something. I mean, I saw this guy. So it's like it to me. Climbing aloft is addictive. Those of us who like it, love it. People like Sven from Boston, though, who don't, well... Yeah, just curious as to why not. Or, or okay, here's, how about this? Why is everybody else so excited to go up there? I have no idea. I'd rather walk around naked in Cologne and hope I got beat to death. <laughs> than go up to the Royal. Yeah. Whoa, now that is scary. Up until now, if you saw Jeannie from Chicago climbing aloft, you would have been seeing an apparition. Nope. Be, feel a little motion, but it's really calm today. <laughs> Hi, Mom! Don't watch this! What's so special about working up here? Getting up here and talking to people about it, you know, the people who don't climb. I mean, the people on the ship who don't climb get a good idea of what it's like just because they see it go down, but I don't know how you'd really describe it to somebody who doesn't come up here. You know, somebody who doesn't sail, somebody who hasn't been in this situation. They can appreciate it, they can imagine what it's like, but it's really an impossible thing to describe. It, it is exactly what you think, you know, but when you're up really high and the ship is listing a little bit when the seas are on, you know, you're moving a lot. Explain this, you know, it's, you come up, you get a big rush. After a while, you stop getting the rush because it comes a little bit more, not ordinary, but it's something you do and it's less, um, less exciting and then you take it for granted and then you have a minute slip it doesn't really even put you in jeopardy at all and suddenly <gasps> you know that your heart's up in your throat and geez you get that rush back pretty quick you're not long without it until it comes back again if you get scared going aloft it can really ground you Jeannie tried it in Lunenburg but she got the fear and hasn't gone aloft since I couldn't get over the fact of like the thought of just kind of like splatting on the deck that just kept running through my head so I had to come back down. Take your time. Now with the help of Krista from Canada, she's ready to try again. I was just thinking about going aloft and how it'd be kind of exciting and looking out and actually going up there and kind of being useful and doing work. There you go. Okay. Now grab on. Standing on a foot rope is harder on your brain than it is on your feet. Now bring your other arm, bring your weight over here, and step on. Good job. How does it feel, Jeannie? It feels awesome. Good job. First time up. So far, so good. But the tough part of the climb is still ahead.
it's very cool. I don't know how soon I'll be up here again, but <laughs> enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> I was just so excited. I remember one time looking up and seeing Krista up on the Royal, and she just seemed to be having a blast up there, like talking and laughing and carrying on. And I always thought that if I ever got up there, I'd never be able to do that. And when the when Maria, Krista, and I were all up there. You know, it was just like we were having a conversation on deck. You did awesome. You climbed right up. It was no problem. Just as Jeannie's ready to call it a day, she's pressured to go higher. Yeah, you can just climb right to there, then you can just climb right back down. Why am I doing that? Just well, for more excitement. If you haven't already had enough of an exciting day. Let's see about this. Pivot. Okay. I won't get stuck on anything. Easy spot. <laughs> Look at you, smiley. Look at you. Damn, girl. Jeannie has to do a little bit more monkeying around before she'll be able to do work aloft. But her dream of having a casual conversation up here is now a reality. This is a little scary thinking I'm up on that one that goes right across. <laughs> Hi, David! <laughs> Hi, Max! <laughs> Get up here! <laughs> Hi, Mom! Don't watch this! <laughs> Hi, Dad! <laughs> Hi, Maureen! <laughs> and from the foremast, Jeannie learns that she is the hero of the day. We've been at sea for three weeks now, and pulling into the sandblast islands off the coast of Panama, we feel as though we've entered a parallel universe. The sandblasts are run by Kuna Indians. Seventy years ago, after the Kunas massacred two dozen Panamanian policemen, Panama granted them autonomous rule over these 360-some-odd islands. A canoe invasion marks the beginning of Mola Madness. My negotiation skills in Spanish are a little weak. Kuna women board our ship, get us all excited, and then charge us double what they do on land for their intricately hand-sewn crafts called molas. Catfish. Huh? Okay, we'll take these two. Five bucks each, right? Okay, we'll sort it out. So what are we up to? That's another ten bucks. Huh? Ninety. We're up to $90. Yeah, we're getting the mask. We're getting some mask. The mask. You got the mask? We'll tie the mask off. How about we take this one here? And we'll take this one. This one here? This one here? Okay. Okay, so you all work it out. That money, that we pay for that. Well, that's you. I'm just thinking that who, so that's mom covered. We're getting her a mom, is that good? Yeah. No, I'm flying her in at some point. I just got to give her a symbol of something that she can open on the day. But it's nice. Look at how it is. It gives you some space to breathe. It does. <laughs> Turning to the runway now, you can see that Annalisa has gone totally native, while Greg has stayed completely Michigan. But forget the clothes. Check out those grins. Good morning. Good morning indeed. Smiles like that can only mean one thing. A crappy, rough day marks the end of our first leg at sea. We'll dock in the Panama Canal's Atlantic entrance this afternoon. The anxiety I felt upon leaving Lunenburg was only a few weeks ago, but already things have changed dramatically in my mind. The ship feels much bigger to me these days. Where once I used to feel penned in, now I find space. I think it's because the 40-plus people I'm living with no longer feel like strangers. At this stage, we're family. We touch. We share, we teach, we learn, we lie like rugs and sit where we fit and give head rubs to anyone who asks. We live like a single organism. Heart, brain, soul, it's all here. We have everything. Except a couch. Man, I miss having a couch. <laughs> oh well, I sure don't miss being single.
Oh yeah, did I mention that? I met some. On the next episode of Tall Ship Chronicles, we survive an ancient ritual as we cross the equator. Temperatures rise as relationships get hot and bothered. New Year's in Galapagos sets our world on fire. And you'll be shocked as some people jump ship while the rest of us hold on for the ride of our lives. That's next time on Tall Ship Chronicles.